All right. Now you've understood the basics of the Gibbs free energy or the energy of what energy of the reaction. Absolutely. Now, as we said, we have to try to understand it in a more, uh, you know, exemplified way. So let's take an example of a reaction. First of all, let me draw a nice cell right here. Wow. Put a nice nucleus in there. Then you got, you know, a mitochondria. Wow, I am really bad at drawing. You got, a, I don't know, a Golgi apparatus, okay? And then let's say you got some ribosomes right here, right? You got your ribosomes. And we know the ribosomes are responsible for what? Let's take a magnifying glass and look at them outside. These ribosomes are responsible for what? They're responsible for protein production, right? They're responsible for producing protein. What is protein made up of? Protein is made up of amino acids. So let's go ahead and zoom into this mic into this ribosome and see what's going on. So basically, let's say it receives its amino acids. You have amino acid number one, let's say, and you have amino acid number two. And what you want to do, protein is essentially what? It's a series of peptide bonds. Uh, and peptide bonds are basically the bonds that are between amino acids, right? So you have A1 to A2. Now let me ask you a question. Intuitively, do you think this is an exergonic spontaneous reaction with a negative uh, delta G? Or do you think this is a positive delta G and non-spontaneous endergonic reaction. If you're saying that this is a non-spontaneous endergonic reaction, then you are absolutely correct. This is a reaction that requires energy. If you're building peptide bonds, you are going to need energy in order to form these bonds. So since this is an endergonic reaction and it requires energy, what did we say, that rule of thumb? We said any endergonic reaction requires what? Requires an equivalent exergonic reaction with it that will provide the releasing energy in order for that endergonic reaction to happen. So you're going to need energy. And we know in our body the major molecule of energy is what? ATP. ATP is broken down to what? To AMP and something called high energy phosphate, PPI, right? This inorganic phosphate is what is providing the energy to make this peptide bond. So if we underline it right here, this is providing the energy to make the peptide bond. Now this is an exergonic reaction. So if we go ahead and say this one has a delta G, that is what? that is greater than zero. It's endergonic, right? And this has a delta G that is less than zero. It is exergonic. Now, I call these reactions the mirror U reactions. Let me tell you why. You're going to see this a lot in biochemistry. Let's draw the reaction again. So they, they go ahead and they say you got A1, you got A2, and it's converted to amino acid 1, peptide bond, amino acid 2. I call the mirror U reaction because they usually bring the exergonic reaction right here that is providing the high energy phosphate in order for this phosphate bond, right? In order for this peptide bond. This is the one that's providing the energy. Ah, of course, you think you got away like that? No, there's obviously going to be some sort of enzyme over here. And we do have an enzyme called peptidyl transferase, PT or peptidyl transferase. Now, this is an example of how endergonic reactions and exergonic reactions are coupled together. The board and the USMLE, they like to ask you, well, you know what? I understand that you know what spontaneous exergonic reactions are, non-spontaneous, but I want you to represent it on a graph. So the graph is usually going to look like this. Let's say we're talking about a spontaneous exergonic reaction. That means the delta G is less than zero. So representing this on a graph, on the y-axis, 
we have energy. On the x-axis, we have the process or time. So this is a spontaneous exergonic reaction. The delta G is less than zero, meaning that the energy of the substrate is greater than the energy of the product, right? We said S is greater than P, correct? So if you go ahead and draw, the reaction begins from the substrate to the product. It's S to P, right? So you're going to start with the substrate, which is high energy. It's going to be like around here. And then you're going to go down all the way to the energy of the product. So you got the energy of the substrate, which is, let's say, we call it S over here. And the energy of the product is B right here. And you can go ahead and draw sort of a dotted line. So the differential between them is what exactly? It's the delta G, absolutely. And that's going to be less than zero. So as you can see, the energy of the substrate greater than the energy product. Now you might be asking yourself, well, what's going on over here? What is this? What is this right here? What is this hump over here? And I'm going to tell you about what this hill over here represents later on. So this is exactly how a spontaneous exergonic reaction looks like. Let's take a look at the endergonic reactions, the non-spontaneous reactions. The energy of the substrate is less than the energy of the product. So your reaction is going to start right here and then it's going to go up and it's sort of an uphill battle as we said. And then the energy of the product is much, much greater. So if we draw it right here, we see that the energy of the substrate is low. The energy of the product is much greater. And the differential between them, again, draw that dotted line, and you get the differential between them, delta G greater than zero. Now, the final one, which is delta G equals zero. Now, when delta G equals zero, the energy of the substrate is equal to the energy of the product. So that means A and B should be on the same dotted line. So you got A, and then you got sort of a hump right here, and then you got B, and I'm gonna explain. And they're on the same dotted line, right? So if we draw them right here, you got A and you got B. They're on the same line, all right? Now you might be asking, what on earth is that hump? You understood the delta G, but you didn't really understand what that little hump was about. All right, let me explain it to you. Let's take a spontaneous exergonic reaction as an example. All right, this is the reaction process. This is the, this is the energy required. Let's take it as an example. We said in a spontaneous exergonic reaction, the energy of the substrate is greater than the energy of the product. We start over here with S being greater than P. All right, and then we get over here to this hump right here and then we go down. It's not straight line down as we can see, right? So let's put these dotted lines. So here's the delta G and it's less than zero. But what on earth is this right here? That's the question. So we see right here, before A can really get to B, it has to get over a hump. And what this is, is that in the conversion of A to B, or let's say S to P, whatever you want, the reaction requires what? It requires breaking down bonds, building bonds. Usually when you go from A to B, it's not A to B directly. It's usually going to go through an intermediate form, an intermediate form called AB. So you usually go from A to AB and then to B. This form usually has greater energy. So usually it has greater energy than, than the substrate, this intermediate form, okay? So we call this an intermediate form. Why is this important to us? So think about it. Remember that hill that we talked about? Let's draw that wonderful hill we talked about. And we said that in a spontaneous exergonic reaction, the ball is right here. Now in reactions, usually there's going to be sort of a barrier right here. Now you can get someone to nudge the ball. He'll nudge the ball, the ball will go down, it hit that barrier, it won't, it won't go down. The reaction won't happen. But if you get another person to come and help him, that ball might get through that barrier and actually complete the reaction, go down, release the energy. So that's exactly what this area represents. This area represents that ball. And what we call this, this sort of transitional zone, this transitional zone is referred to as the delta G 
plus plus. This is what we call the energy of activation. So this is the energy of activation. In order for A to become B, it really needs to overcome this small hump over here or represented on the graph as this barrier right here. Now, you might be like, who's this second person right here? This second person right here represents an enzyme. So, if we go ahead and draw two graphs, Look at these two diagrams. So if you look at the first diagram, you see that we have a spontaneous exergonic reaction with the energy of the substrate A being greater than the energy of the product B. And we have a differential between them, which is the Gibbs free energy, which is going to be less than zero. Absolutely. Now we talked about that hump and we said that this is the energy of activation and we refer to it as the delta G plus plus. Now, what exactly do enzymes do? Enzymes, they are catalytic agents. What they do is that, if you noticed, they decrease the energy of activation. So you look at these enzymes right here. What they did is that they decreased the energy of activation. So enzymes decrease the energy of activation, which is the delta G++. plus plus. They do not touch the delta G. The energy of the reaction that's required for the reaction to happen will not be affected. The energy of the reaction is not affected by enzymes. Whether the reaction will happen or not, enzymes don't govern that. What enzymes do is they make this reaction much, much faster. That's exactly what enzymes do, and that's why enzymes are so important. They affect the kinetics of a reaction, not the thermodynamics. I hope you guys have benefited from this first lecture series um, of biochemistry. Um, if you guys really like this lecture, um, we will go ahead and do more lectures like this. Um, we have sort of an outline set for this program. Uh, if you guys have any tips for me uh, or, you know, criticism or feedback, be sure to uh, go ahead and contact me at aogamal at elfaisal.edu. Thank you so much for your time, everybody, and I hope you benefited a lot. Till next time.